So this is my Hako 470 desoldering station. I've had it about 40 years and recently it developed a problem where I had plenty of heat, plenty of suction. I'd pull the trigger, vacuum would come on, but when I released the trigger, the vacuum pump would not shut off. What was happening was the only way I could shut off the vacuum pump once it was activated was to turn off the system. Well, it's fixed now. And since I couldn't find this information anywhere, um, we'll go through the process of figuring out what was wrong with it. Now, the first thing I suspected was the micro switch that's inside the gun. I, there's in, right behind this little trigger, there's a micro switch, like very similar to a mouse switch. I can't tell you how many of these uh, we replaced back in the day when people actually used desktop computers. And they're all different styles and they would go high resistance, they would be intermittent and so on. So I'm reasonable to assume that we might have a micro switch problem. So I took the gun apart, very easy. There's just three screws here, but the switch back here was working perfectly, meaning that when you push the trigger, it closed. When you opened, released the trigger, it opened and went infinite resistance. Now, what I didn't know at the time was the pinout of this cable. So here's how you can clear your gun if you're having this problem. When you pull the trigger, the bottom two connections on this socket are shorted. When you release the trigger, the short goes away and this connection opens. So we can simulate the gun with a little jumper that I fashioned here out of a paper clip. Now watch how this is going to work. I'm just going to short these out. Stick this. There we go. Now when I turn this on, since the trigger is pulled now, the pump should start. And when I pull this out of here, if if the machine is working properly the pump should shut off so let's see if that's the case pull it out pump shuts off so see if the pump stays running when you pull this out then you know it's not the gun because the gun is not connected so it can't possibly be what's causing the problem okay so that's that's number one, and you can clear the gun just by making a little jumper out of a paper clip. All right, so what's the next suspect? Well, uh, the next suspect would be the check valve. There's a check valve. Yay, that's tight. There's a check valve right back here. In fact, the part number of the check valve, and a lot of people in the forum say that this is the problem. Here's your part number, B as in beta. 1032. That's that's my old one. I had one in stock. So I, I put it in. Now it's right behind this filter. I'm going to get the filter out. Now, if you look carefully, the top of the valve is right there. And when I turn this on, you'll see that that pulls in, and when you shut off the vacuum, that pops back out. Can you see this little center moving in and out? Okay, so this one is working. That's what it looks like. Nevertheless, there are lots of people online who say that valve is the problem. So to get at it, you just 
pull this little ring off, little plastic ring here. Now there's a little white washer, see? Here's my original. See the little white washer? Just right there, moving. That fell off just now. If you look carefully, you can see it in, inside. We're going to try to get that out of there. So if that happens to you, make sure the white washer, plastic washer, comes with it. There it is. Okay, so I pulled my original out, and it felt very sticky. It just the action of it. It was sticky. There was sticky stuff on on the shaft. So I cleaned it up with isopropyl alcohol, put the washer back on it, put it all back together. No difference. Still, pump still would not shut off. But people insist this is the problem. Okay. So I had a brand new one in stock. Here it is. Part number B is in beta, 1032. Check valve for the 470. So I put in the brand new one, which actually was this one. And no difference. It pump still would not shut off. But here's the kicker. You don't have to buy a brand new one to prove this we can eliminate the check valve because you don't need the check valve. The pump will still run without it. Let's prove it. No valve. Pump is running. Remove the short. Pump shuts off. You don't need this valve. I think the function of this check valve is to prevent debris, atmospheric debris, pollen, what have you, from somehow migrating into the unit. It's sort of like the check valve in the in the sprayer on a garden hose. You release the trigger, the garden hose shuts off because you know, the valve has stopped the flow. In this case, it's just preventing stuff from migrating into the unit. Well, the point is that if it runs with the valve removed, if it shuts off, then you know it's not this valve. So at this point, we've cleared the gun. We know it's not the gun. We know it's not the check valve. So the next two suspects, lots of discussion about this online, is this diaphragm set, part number A1013, and also this valve plate set, part number A1014. Now, this represents about $45 with shipping for these two parts total. Now, that's what I paid. I bought some new ones. And these go on either side of the pump. The pump motor is in the middle of this box. So you've got one set on this side, one set on that side of the motor. They're very easily installed. Here's my old ones. Now, I didn't see anything wrong with these. They look perfectly fine. They're quite flexible. They're not particularly dirty. They have a nice round flex ridge here. It looks similar to a speaker cone on a stereo speaker. Now the new ones are just flat rubber. They don't have that that ridge. It's the new ones are just flat rubber. They're a lot thinner rubber than this, with five holes drilled in them. And you can see that the screw that was a it's a washer head screw, and you can see right here the impression of the washer. The new ones came with these little tiny screws. I, I couldn't see how that was going to work very well. So I, even though I couldn't see anything wrong with these, look, I cleaned that one up a bit. Doesn't it look brand new? I put the new ones in and I used the older screws because I, I thought they held a little bit better. Then we have these valve plates. Well,
I didn't clean these because you can see that they are dirty. These are like the diaphragms on a lawnmower or a gasoline engine. One must be intake, maybe one is exhaust. And there's some debris that's connected here, but the plate itself is still very flexible. So I, these could easily be cleaned and reinstalled, but I had new ones. So I reinstalled the new ones, but they're not torn, they're not ripped. I, I can't imagine why you couldn't just clean these and put them back in. But I, at least we did find some debris on them. So it should be fixed now, right? Well, even with all the new parts. Probably $60 worth of parts here if you count this, count this check valve. It was still broken. It, the pump still would not shut off. So what's left? What's left is the control PCB, which is directly behind this front panel. So let's take that apart and let me show you what was actually wrong with this 470. So we separate the PCB from the front panel. And the first thing we see is a big corroded area right here on the circuit board. It looks like paint remover. Look how everything is discolored and bubbled up. Flip the board over and the other side looks okay, except if you look very carefully, there's a shine there, like a, almost like it's been blackened. Look at the upper right corner, it's brown, and now you look here at the component area and you can see quite a color difference. So the first thing we need to do is flip the board over and scrub off all that paint remover with isopropyl alcohol and an old toothbrush, but the minute we do that, it removes the green solder mask. It's just lifting the paint right off the board. What a mess. And I should like to mention, it stinks of dead fish. The minute you put heat to it or alcohol on it, man, does it stink. It's, it, it's almost unbearable. All right, so we get these caps desoldered and you can see how wet they are. Look at those puddles beneath the cap. And there they are, puddles right on the circuit board. Th this is big trouble. That all has to be cleaned off. And look at D12 right next to it. There is a lot of fluid there. Now, I don't have caps that size. It only, they only measure about 14 millimeters. So we're going to use something bigger. Use what I have. They're too big to fit, but We'll just put them on the other side. There's plenty of room between the back of the board and the pump for the larger caps. And that's what they look like. Now we cleaned off C11 and C12. That's very important. And we're tackling C2, which is just below. We'll pull out C2 and look at the puddle underneath it. You'd never know until you remove that cap. Also got C3 out. Look, C3 is not leaking. You surely, clearly see a puddle under C2, but not under C3. So again, we've got to clean all of that liquid off the PCB. I'm going to use what I have in stock. They're a little bit larger, but they're going to fit perfectly. So here's a list of everything that we've done so far. We've replaced three parts that we didn't need to replace. Uh, about $60 spent unnecessarily. And we replaced five caps that we already had in stock. Now here's the interesting thing. 
none of the five components that we replaced check bad. We're going to prove that using this very nice MK328 component tester. So we'll start with C2. Now it doesn't matter how you connect the leads. I'm going to have to put this camera back on the stand here. The machine figures it out. So we'll just connect yellow to one connection. Polarity doesn't matter. Use yellow and green. Okay. Now we'll turn it on. Tells us that we have a capacitor. It's reading 91.55 microfarad. Voltage loss is 1.5%. ESR is less than 1 ohm. Now, plus or minus 10%, this is a 100 microfarad cap. Plus or minus 10%, 90 microfarad would put it in spec. And you can remove components all day long and you're going to find plus or minus 10%. So nothing here, nothing here flags a bad component. All right, let's, let's try another one. That was C2, the one that was leaking, leaking to high heaven. All right, C3 coming up. I don't see any fluid on this one. Another cap, 92.67 microfarad, that's within the 10%. We lost 1.5%, that's normal. ESR less than 1 ohm. Nothing here to be concerned about. These parts look perfectly normal. All right, let's try the next one. Now, I actually didn't find anything wrong with this part except for the fact that it was so it's 2500 microfarad, 25 volt, 85 degrees. Well, it's 40 years old, it's 85 degrees. It's going to test good. It's not leaking. It's not wet on the bottom. All right, press that test button. But look at that, 96.88 microfarad, VLOS, 1%, ESR, that's equivalent series resistance, less than half an ohm. There's nothing wrong with this cap. This, this cap didn't really need to be replaced, but for the cost of it, which is pennies actually, while I was in there, I replaced it. But, but this really didn't need to be replaced. Just preventative maintenance. All right, let's look at these two. Now, these are really wet. Two hundred and three microfarad. Voltage loss less than 1%, ESR 1.4 ohms. Nothing to be alarmed about here. Yet we know that this is leaking electrolyte everywhere. So what's causing our failure? Is it the leaking electrolyte shorting out the circuit? Yes, it is. Or is it the component? Well, it's the component that's causing the leaking electrolyte, but the component values, as shown on this tester, indicate that it's perfectly fine. So what we're trying to prove here, oh, look how wet that is. What we're trying to prove here is that you can't always rely 
on your instruments. And here's the last one. This one was leaking too. Two hundred and eleven microfarad, V loss one point two percent, ESR of one point one ohm. Nothing to be alarmed about here. So according to this tester, these are all good components. Yet we know that these are the components that were causing the failure. So once again, visual inspection is your best test tool. All right now here's here's another thing. Let's Let's look at an instrument that few people have in there on their workbench. This is a UV light, ultraviolet flashlight, only cost a few dollars. Little LED flashlight. Let's see what it's going to do for us. Right at the top right now, there's quite a blob of electrolyte. And you see that shine right there under the ultraviolet light. Now this was C2. Let's take a look at C3. Now, as I recall, C3 was not leaking. And if we look at it under the light, It's pretty clean. Okay. Let's look at this one. I'm not sure this was C14. This is the one that didn't need to be replaced, but we replaced it anyway while we were in there. Okay, pretty clean. I don't remember these C11 and C12. These were the big culprits. Do you see the iridescent glow there? And those are really wet. So if you're having trouble identifying the leaking electrolyte or you can't find it on a circuit board, especially if it's eaten through a trace and caused an open circuit, this little ultraviolet flashlight will help you to find it. And we'll check the last one. Don't know if the camera's picking this up. Boy, it's sure obvious to the naked eye. Well, it sure is nice to have my old friend back working like new again. All I can say is, after 40 years, Domo Origato Empregados de Jaco. This thing is well made, easy to take apart, easy to service. I know I wouldn't want to be without it. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching. Time for some new feet. The old ones were missing and falling off and sticky mess everywhere. Well, we've got it clean, so now we'll put on these new feet.